really honored to be here tonight. We're just thankful for being able to get to know Laverne and Rhonda so well. We've really enjoyed our hearts being able to be connected and our, our hearts are for the same ministry and it kind of we just kind of are together for sure when it comes to that. So talking and talking about stuff, it's easy when we're together. I did several missions trips with the church and I went, took a team to Peru and I took my son with me, who was then about, what, 14, I think. Um, so it was his first real missions trip, and we went to Peru to build a school. And it was a one, it was incredible, a wonderful time. Um, I had the privilege of, of they, they had us go up the Amazon River to a remote village because there were several people that had gotten saved in the last six months, and they wanted the American preacher to baptize them. Well, I was so honored. I mean, that was like a dream come true for me to be able to do that. So we did. We went up river and went to this village, and I got to go out into the Amazon River and baptize these people. While I was standing in the Amazon River, uh, the people on the shore saw me. I kind of jumped because something, like, bit me or something. Um, and I didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it, but something happened. Uh, within 24 hours, and thankfully it was last day, uh, by the time I got to Miami, I was not well, and it was not pretty. But then about five years later, four years later, I was just doing life insurance, and they had to do blood tests. And it was in that blood test that they found that I had hepatitis C. And they assumed, based on what happened in Peru and how I got sick, it, it, testily, they believed that at that same time I was infected because it appeared to be a new infection. It was the worst thing I'd ever gone through in my life. Six months of taking this medicine, and I, I was so sick, I didn't know when I'd be able to preach on Sunday. I couldn't study. I couldn't think. I had no energy. I was depressed. I was lethargic. It was just horrible. And Linda was scared. She didn't know what it, what it meant, if it could end up being something that could literally take my life. You know, I'm fighting through that and just trying to make life work and just asking God what's going on. And Linda's scared. She's, you know, wanting everybody to just be praying for us, for me. Well, I've learned a lot <laughs> since then, but at that time I was really codependent on Tim. Um, and so I took on the responsibility that he wasn't able to keep up. I assumed it. I was never asked. Um, but I just assumed the responsibilities as the pastor that he wasn't able to cover. And so I'd reach out to people and um, the board and different uh, lining up speakers for Sunday. And I just, you know, when we get out of God's plan for our lives, um, we, we put ourselves in a dangerous position. And I thought I was doing the right sure. thing. And that's, you know, yeah. Like but, we always do. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the things I had done is write an email and email had just started or I had just learned it anyway so I'll put it that way. <laughs> I had just learned it in um, I think it was 1999 and this was 2000 and um, so I'm emailing like because we were a Bible college we had pastoral friends all over you know so I just emailed everybody we knew and just asked for prayer um, would be looking for speakers and that kind of thing for Sundays uh, and I remember at the time, when I think back now, I remember being very burdened, very overwhelmed. And all of, we share all that background because it all adds up and feeds into where we were emotionally by then. And so in, in emailing all these different pastors, of course, they write back and inter interact with you know how Tim's doing and that kind of thing. And there was a particular man, pastor, who was a family friend of ours been in our wedding, and Tim would typically be emailing him if he was well, but he wasn't even at his computer, that kind of thing, so I was keeping up with that correspondence. And over the course of just a few short weeks, he started to share with me marriage problems that he was having. And one thing just led to another. I hadn't realized how vulnerable I was or how needy I was of having somebody to talk to. Um, we had been so tied up in ministry that I was totally unaware. I had no self-awareness of where I was emotionally at all. Nor did um, I. Yeah. So I began 
caring about that. And I would tell Tim about it. It wasn't like it was all in secret, but um, I've taught it for years. Even then, I had taught it for years. You know, for women, to only counsel with women and men with men, um, as far as you know, lay counseling, that kind of a thing. And so I, I just fell hooked blind and sinker. Somebody cared about me. I started emailing often. Um, I found myself within six weeks thinking, I had married the wrong person. I was in love with this person, this pastor that lived 2,000 miles away. And Tim was probably going to die. You know, all this irrational thinking began to just invade my mind. And um, I was walking with the Lord. I was still doing um, my walking and exercising with Christian worship music on, with headphones. I mean, that's what deception looks like. And that's why we share our story. Because to another person or to each of you sitting there, unless you've experienced something like that, it sounds like, how in the world really? Could you really get sucked into something like that when you know better? You're like, how does that happen? Or you might have friends or family members that that's happened to, and you're like, oh. You know, why them? How did they not see this coming? Yeah. Um, that's what deception is. You know, our heart, my heart's cry, is all of us. Every single one of us is susceptible to that deception. Sure. And the, the scariest place to be is to, to think we're not. To think, no, I, I've been through enough that I'd recognize that coming. And, and um, that's a big mistake. But to be able to admit to the Lord, to your spouse, to yourself, but for the grace of God, there go I. And that's, that's the truth. Any one of us. I mean, I never would have thought that could have been me. Yeah. I was the, uh, the daughter that the parents would lean on. I was the one that would do right. I was the one that was afraid to get into trouble. Yeah. Um, how could that happen? It did not make any sense. But to fast forward that, he's still sick. Um, I carried on this email conversation with this pastor, friend of our family, for about six full weeks. And then in the mail, in the church mail, came a brochure for a leadership conference in the area of ministry that I was involved in and overseeing at our church. And this is this is what deception looks like. Yep. I remember, I remember exactly where I was standing when I opened that brochure and that that event was taking place in the same city that this man lived in. And when I opened that brochure, I literally said this to myself, Lord, you're so good to me. You care about me so much and that I'm hurting that you are allowing me to go on this trip to be with this person. I mean, it sounds like utter insanity. God would no more have done that. Um, but I really, really thought that that's what deception looks like. When you're deceived, it's ugly. It's ugly. And when we counsel with other couples and, and one of the two of them is either involved in another relationship or is not seeing clearly what their relationship can be and not see the potential, they're in deception. Yeah. And, and I have a lot more grace for them because yeah. when, when I found out what was happening, my thing was like, just stop. Just make a choice. Just do the right thing. That was not realistic. That was not possible where she was then. It just wasn't. And I just could not get my head around that. It's like, what do you mean? So when I deal with couples now where that's happening, I'm like, I get it. Okay, I believe you, but that's not the end of the story. So trust me that I get it, but you got to do something to get out of it. So anyway, yeah. didn't mean to hijack. No, no, I, this is our story. <laughs> um, but anyways, I, I went on that trip, and I met with that person. And I was in that city for five days. And, I mean, did I have, you know, what I thought was a wonderful time? Yeah. And my <laughs> conscience at that point, it, it just wasn't there. there. I just thought I was in a fantasy world. Yeah. And that's where you go. Um, 
when I came home, I was a mess. I mean, I still loved him. I was all about family. Family has always been a passion in my heart. And um, what do you do then? I mean, I really felt like I was in love with this person. And we, I opened a mailbox so he could send me things, and he did. And soon thereafter, maybe a month after I returned, Everything was exposed, Tim found out, and could go into how that happened, and that alone is a miracle, but at that point, I knew, well, I didn't know, I didn't know, and Tim was like, you know, ready to take the ring off my finger, because, well, you have to decide, you know, it was a, it, we were both manic, um, and I knew I didn't want him to take the ring off, but I could not cut the ties with this other person. And we have found this to be really... And this was weeks in, so this yeah. is like four weeks after I found out that I took the ring off, not the first day. But just so you know, that wasn't my knee-jerk reaction. It was like, okay, no. I can't keep doing this. Right. So but when she wouldn't let me take the ring off, I mean, she's not what I would call a strong person. Okay, I mean, just like, you know, she's feminine and dainty. And when I tried to take that ring off her finger, her hand became so strong, and I'm like... Okay, this means something, but I'm not <laughs> sure what. <laughs> yeah, because at that point, I hadn't been able to break the connection with the other yeah. person. I, Tim had gone with me. We closed the mailbox, and I opened a second mailbox because I just couldn't imagine surviving without this connection. It was so real and made me feel so alive. Um, we closed, He found out about that, and we closed it, and I opened a third one. And that is what addiction looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It's a hard place. It's a really hard place. That's why we're in marriage ministry. Not because we've done it right and have all those tools and all this education about it. Um, we learned the hard way. We learned how, how easy it can happen to the least an unsuspecting person and how hard it is to break. Especially, we have found this, and it's, this might be an overgeneralization, but just take it for what it's worth. We have found that if it's the woman, when you're counseling a couple, if the woman has already found somebody else, then it's really, really hard to get that couple back together because the woman has this outside relationship with emotional attachment. A man is more Can typically, be, yeah. more just physically. Involved. So, but that's just for those of you that couples. So, um, obviously, you know, we initially it was like I was just I was fighting for us. She was not fighting for us. She would just look at me and say, "Tim, you don't get it, do you? I don't love you anymore. Let me go." Yeah. Let's see. Sorry, that's not the deal I made. And because I love you, I am not going to stop fighting. I am going to fight until my death if I have to. And so we kept together for seven weeks until we could get to a place that we went to for an intensive counseling in Colorado. And uh, back then, it's not this anymore, but back then it was it was ten days. We were there for ten days. And... On day five, we had breakthrough. I wish I had time to tell you how that happened. That was pretty phenomenal in and of itself. But it was on day five that we knew, we knew we made it. Well, I'd taken three months sabbatical, whatever you want to call it, from the church to repair my marriage. That was all that mattered. And I agreed, the board had agreed that I would that we would meet with them three months later and we would present to them where we'd come, what had happened, blah, 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 and that they would make a decision. Well, three months later, I mean, we were like in heaven. I mean, we were just like, we knew that what we had experienced and what we had was beyond anything we had ever had our entire married life. We knew that something changed that radically transformed the way we thought about each other, about marriage, about God, all of it. And so, 
we were so excited to go back to meet with our board, and I was like, I, I knew that we'd be better pastors and leaders than we ever had been because of what we now knew about life and love. And we walked into that room, and we knew something was wrong. And ultimately, they just said, you know, we just think you guys ought to just move on. It's probably going to be better for your marriage. And I wanted to say, how can losing two incomes overnight be better for your marriage? <laughs> I mean, really, that's, that's just the practicalities of it. That's what happened. So it was two weeks before Christmas. And Linda and I prayed, God, what are we supposed to do? And it was that story of Solomon with the baby. And it was like, we came here to plant a church, to grow a church, to make a church healthy. And we knew that if we stayed, although we could do it and we'd keep that core group or whatever, it would divide the church. It would split it. And we just said, we're, that's not what we're about. We don't care what happens to us. We are not doing that to them. And so we resigned. And when we resigned, we lost income. I lost my car. We ended up having to sell our house, which was the only thing we had that had money to it. And we had to live off of our equity for almost a year. But it was in that year that God began a, a stirring in my soul because I, I thought I was supposed to be a pastor. You know, I thought I was supposed to go find another church and just thought, well, I can you know do men's seminars and retreats and go and just tell men where I had failed as a man, as a husband, as a father, and maybe that will resonate with some guys, you know. So I wrote this seminar. I called some pastor friends. I said, hey, this is what I'm doing. You can. So I ended up getting some retreats that I did, and I can't, I can't explain it. I can't tell you why. It wasn't because the material was all that great. It was just, I was just me. I just told them me how I had responded to so many things with us and how, how much it didn't work. And these guys were eating out of my hands. I mean, it was like, they're just like, so did you read my mail? How did you know this was, you know, I'm serious, it was just all the time. So I just started doing these seminars as often as I could, and we'd get enough to squeak by. And, and then we thought, well, if we're going to do this, we better come up with a marriage one too. So, so Lynn and I wrote a marriage seminar and started doing marriage seminars and, and, and retreats. And for, the, for how many years following that, like five years, we pretty much four years, we did nothing but travel. We just go from place to place. I'd get seminars or retreats and and that's how true relationships was born. It was just grassroots. I there was no like let's put an action plan together. <laughs> let's let's write out a mission. We we were just doing what we could, you know, to share our lives and what God had done in us. And I guess that's really what ministry is all about, isn't it? You know, what's that saying? You you, you get a message from a mess and you get a testimony from a test, you know, it's like we just used our mess and just said, hey, you know, if it happened to us, I got a feeling it could happen to some of you. And here's what I want you to, to know. So we moved here 11 years ago and brought true relationships with us. And it was funny because when we moved here, it changed from doing seminars to doing counseling. And again, that was not my, like, wise action plan it was just it just happened and I've kind of done that's how I've done ministry it's been very grassroots very organic you know like I said we, we moved here about 11 years ago and the, the, the ministry has just grown we've been in lots of churches and done our seminars but we've also had a lot of pastors that refer those marriage issues that they just can't deal with and I get it as a pastor you can't be giving weeks and months of hours to, to help just one couple when you've probably got more than one in your congregation. Our offices are in, at Grace Crossing Church in Beaver Creek, which is on Beaver Valley Road 
easy to get to if you know where it's at. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you must have lost. Use your GPS. <laughs> yeah, use, use, your, uh, use your, your phone. Um, so, uh, our website is truerelationships.org, and you can call us for information. Go to our website, email me.